Hello, I'm Eric Huang. You're listening to Saint Podcast, a podcast about the always fascinating and often controversial lives of the saints. This is a history and culture podcast that traces the origins of morality tales of the saints, also known as hagiographies, and how they continue to impact life today. We only have two more episodes in our ongoing series dedicated to martyrs, saints who died as a result of their beliefs. Episode eight is about a saint who, by all accounts, was a giant who stood up to twelve feet tall. He's the patron saint of athletics, travelers, journeys and transportation in general, epilepsy, the city of Havana in Cuba, and bachelors. His legend inspired a fashion craze with surfers in the late 1950s, and he's famously known for carrying an unbelievably heavy child across a wide river. Most unusually, this saint is often depicted with the dog's head. This is the story of Saint Christopher, the dog-headed giant. Saint Christopher may or may not be a historic figure. The first surviving mention comes from an inscription made around the year 425 at a ruined church in Chalcedon, an ancient Roman maritime town in modern-day Turkey. Veneration of St. Christopher began here and spread westward via religious centers like Reims, Toledo, and Ravenna. From the Middle Ages onwards, his cult was strongest in German-speaking areas until modern times. There are two main strands of the St. Christopher legend, they're called Decius and Dagnus, based on the name of the Roman ruler who was Christopher's antagonist. We'll explore both versions. Alongside the Dagnus and Decius branches of the story are two additional strands. The most well-known today is likely a 12th century creation by a cleric in Germany. This 12th century story is the one that Veragini recounts in the Golden Legend. The version we'll explore now. St. Christopher wasn't always called Christopher. When he was born, sometime in the first half of the 3rd century, his name was Reprobus, which means reject or outcast. It comes from the same root word that gives us reprobate and reproach. It's not a nice name. According to the Golden Legend, Christopher, called Reprobus, was a Canaanite. Canaanite was a catch-all term used in the Bible to refer to an unrelated group of people in an area that encompasses modern-day Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, and southern parts of Syria and Lebanon. Although there were people who called themselves Canaanites, its use in the Bible was pejorative and meant foreigner, non-Jew, non-Greek, other. That Christopher is called a Canaanite and named Reprobus at birth is symbolic of how we're meant to see him, as a degenerate an uncivilized pagan. Christopher, or rather Reprobus, as he's still called at this moment, is huge. Various versions of the legend describe his height to be anywhere from seven and a half to over 12 feet tall. He also has a fearsome face. Terrible is the word used in the golden legend. Reprobus is a big, strong, monstrous looking man and decides to dedicate his life serving only the greatest ruler in the world. He begins by working for the king of his own people, but is quickly disappointed to discover that this king cowers before other greater kings. So Reprobus travels to the court of another ruler who is universally believed to be the world's most powerful. This unnamed king readily takes Reprobus into his service and makes him a member of his court. Reprobus stays in the king's employ until one day the court jester sings a silly song. It mentions the devil several times, and the king, who is a Christian, shudders whilst making the sign of a cross on his forehead every time the devil is invoked. Reprobus, a pagan Canaanite, is unfamiliar with this gesture and who the devil is. He asks the king about it, who explains that he always crosses himself as a protection from this horrible devil. To this, Reprobus replies, If you're afraid of being harmed by the devil, this proves that he is greater and more powerful than you are or you wouldn't be afraid of him. Therefore, I am frustrated in my hope that I had found the greatest and most powerful lord in the world. So now farewell. I'll go and look for the devil, accept him as my master, and become his servant. 
Clearly, if the world's most powerful king is afraid of this devil, the devil must be even more powerful. So Reprobus leaves the king's service that very day to search for this greater lord. Whilst wandering through a desert, he meets a company of soldiers. The most intimidating of them stops Reprobus to ask where he's traveling to. I'm looking for the Lord Devil. I want to take him as my master. Reprobus is in luck. The fierce-looking soldier questioning him is, in fact, the Devil himself. Reprobus pledges his loyalty and joins the Devil's band of marauders, who wander the world wreaking havoc. One day, they come upon a crucifix erected at the side of the road. The Devil panics and hastily leads his men on a detour through a, quote, wild, desolate tract. Reprobus demands the devil explain why he avoided the crucifix with such a lengthy detour. The devil answers that a powerful man named Christ was nailed to a crucifix long ago. Whenever he sees a crucifix, he's filled with terror and can't help but flee. Reprobus replies, Well then, this Christ, whose sign you dread so much, is greater and more powerful than you are. Therefore, I have laboured in vain and have not yet found the greatest prince in the world. So goodbye to you, I'm leaving you, and going in search of Christ. So Reprobus is in search of a master to serve yet again, but he has no idea where to find this man called Christ, and just wanders about. At last, he encounters a hermit, a Christian who teaches the giant about the powerful man he seeks, and instructs Reprobus on how to gain his favor. This king, whom you wish to serve, requires that you do his will in many ways. For instance, you will have to fast frequently. You will also have to offer him many prayers. Reprobus is elated to finally be on the right track, but admits to the hermit that he can't possibly fast. He's a big guy and needs to eat constantly. He also doesn't know what a prayer is and can't do something he knows nothing about. The hermit considers this and suggests something different. Do you know the famous river where many people trying to get across go under and perish? You're big enough and strong enough. Go dwell by the river, and if you help those who wish to cross it, that will greatly please Christ the King whom you wish to serve, and I hope he might show himself to you there. It's good deeds like helping people cross a treacherous river that will get Christ's attention. Reprobus agrees to this course of action and sets up shop by the river, building a shelter by its banks and crafting a long staff from a tree trunk to help steady him in the current. One day, whilst resting in his shelter, Reprobus hears a child calling out. When he investigates, no one's there. He returns to his dwelling when the voice calls out a second time. Again, no one's around. The child calls out a third and final time and shows himself. A small boy stands by the riverbank and begs Reprobus to carry him across. Reprobus places the boy on his shoulders as if he weighed nothing and begins crossing. With every step, the waters become rougher and rougher, and the weight of the child begins pressing down on him, getting heavier and heavier, as heavy as lead according to the golden legend. Just as he's about to collapse under the rising waters and ever-increasing weight of the child, Reprobus reaches the far bank. Placing the child safely on the shore, he admits he was afraid while crossing. They were in real danger of drowning and it felt as if the whole world were on his shoulders. Never before had he carried such a heavy burden. The child answers Reprobus and reveals his identity. You were not only carrying the whole world, you had him who created the world upon your shoulders. I am Christ your King, to whom you render service by doing the work you do here. And if you want proof that what I am saying is true, when you get back to your little house, plant your staff in the earth, and tomorrow you will find it in leaf and bearing fruit. The child vanishes. That night, he plants his staff into the ground as instructed. By morning, the staff is like a tree with palm leaves and palm fruits sprouting from it. Reprobus has finally found the king he's been searching for all this time. The line from the golden legend about having the world on his shoulders inspired explorers from the age of European exploration. Many 16th century paintings of St. Christopher depict him carrying the Christ child on one shoulder and a globe on the other. This is very evocative of the Greek deity Atlas, a giant who carries the world on his back as punishment for siding with the Titans when Zeus and the Olympian gods stage a successful coup. 
The globes and maps in these Christopher paintings are accurate depictions of the ever-evolving view of what people thought the continents looked like as explorers brought back more and more information about the world outside Europe. Check out St. Podcast's website to have a look at some of these works. Reprobus has finally found the ruler he wants to serve and leaves the riverbank a Christian. His name is now Christopher, which means Christ-bearer, since he bore or carried Christ across the river. Christopher the Christ-bearer journeys to Samos, a city in Lycia, another ancient Roman maritime district in modern-day Turkey. Other versions of the story see Christopher journey to Antioch in Syria. But no matter the city, he doesn't understand the local language, Greek. And so he prays. Miraculously, he now knows Greek. This is another dig at Reprobus. Greek was the lingua franca, the language of the wealthy, cultured, and educated. Reprobus, whose name means outcast, who is an other from Canaan, can be assumed to be uneducated, barbaric, and vulgar because this is the stereotype at the time of someone who isn't fluent in Greek. Once Christopher can understand the locals, he covers his fearsome face with a hood to confront officials who are torturing and executing Christians in the town center. As he approaches, one of the guards strikes him in the face. If I were not a Christian, I would quickly have revenge for this insult. Christopher's only reply to this act of violence is a retort. The old Christopher, Reprobus, would have met the slap in the face with tenfold violence in return. But he's changed. Christopher plants his staff into the ground and prays. Suddenly, leaves burst forth from the staff once again. 8,000 people witness this miracle and become Christians. As mentioned at the beginning of this episode, King Dagnus is the name the golden legend gives the ruler of this city, Samos, or Antioch. Many other versions of Christopher's legend also name Dagnus as the ruler. These comprised the Dagnus strand of Christopher's stories. The Decius strand of Christopher's stories names Emperor Decius as the ruler. Dagnus is likely fictional. There's no historic evidence for a ruler with this name at this time and place. Emperor Decius, however, is someone we met in episode 6 about St. Lawrence. Decius is an attested Roman emperor known for Christian persecutions that match the date of Christopher's death in the year 251. We'll continue to refer to the king as Dagnus, though, since we're following the Golden Legend account from the Dagnus strand of Christopher legends. King Dagnus hears of this defiant giant with a fearsome face. He sends 200 soldiers to apprehend him. When they arrive, Christopher is deep in prayer, which frightens the men, so they do nothing. King Dagnus sends 200 more men. When this new regiment arrives, all the soldiers kneel down and pray with Christopher. Having seen his fearsome face and giant stature, the soldiers now admit they'd be unable to compel Christopher to do anything against his will, even though they've been commanded to bring him in by the king. Christopher reassures the men. He's happy to meet the king, but not before converting all 400 soldiers to the Christian faith. They're then told to tie his hands behind his back and bring him in as a prisoner, just as the king had instructed. When King Dagnus gazes upon Christopher, he falls out of his throne, onto his face. When he recovers from this embarrassing slip, he demands to know the name of this hideous giant, causing all the commotion in town. Christopher tells the king that he was born Reprobus, but is now Christopher, the Christ-bearer. The king thinks this is laughable. You have taken a foolish name calling yourself after Christ, who was crucified and could do nothing to save himself, and now can do nothing for you. Now then, you troublemaking Canaanite, why do you not sacrifice to our gods? Christopher replies to the king by dissing his name, calling him Death and the Devil's Partner. The king isn't phased at all. You were brought up among wild beasts, and you can do only the works of savages and talk only of things unknown to men. Now, however, if you are ready to sacrifice, I will bestow great honours upon you. If not, you'll be tortured to death. Christopher refuses to sacrifice. He's thrown into a cell. Meanwhile, the 400 soldiers who had converted to Christianity are beheaded. That night, the king sends two women to Christopher's cell, Nicaea and Aquilina. 
They have been promised untold riches if they succeed in seducing him. Christopher, of course, sees through the deception immediately and prays. The women become more insistent, stroking him and wrapping their arms all about him. When at last they see his terrible face, which the golden legend describes as radiant, burning as if on fire, they beg forgiveness and convert. Nicaea and Aquilina's failure reaches Dagnus. He summons them and demands that they sacrifice to the Roman gods. They agree as long as the king himself witnesses the sacrifice and commands all the people of the city to attend as well. Nicaea and Aquilina appear to have recanted their recent Christian conversion. But this is a trick. Once everyone has assembled at the temple, the women remove their girdles, throw them around the necks of the idols, and pull the sculptures to the ground where they shatter. As punishment, Aquilina is hung up by the wrists and a heavy stone tied to her feet to break her limbs and kill her. Nicaea is thrown into a fire, but she doesn't burn, so she's beheaded. Other versions include gruesome details of additional tortures, many sexual in nature, typical of the fates of women who stand up to men in power in hagiographies. Dagnus now shifts his attention to Christopher, who's beaten with iron rods. Then a heated iron helmet is placed on his head, and he's forced to sit on an iron chair with a fire lit underneath it. Everything melts as if it's made of wax, and Christopher emerges unscathed. In older versions of the story, this miracle makes Dagnus faint. He's unconscious and on the floor for nine hours. Christopher and the guards just hang out until Dagnus finally wakes up to give his next order. Christopher is to be shot with arrows like St. Sebastian. 400 bowmen aim and shoot. Miraculously, the arrows hang in the air, inches away from Christopher's body, unable to harm him. Other versions recount that archers shot arrows at Christopher for 12 hours straight. None of these arrows penetrate Christopher either. When Dagnus returns, expecting to see Christopher's arrow-ridden body, one of the arrows, sometimes two, turns to fly at the king and blinds him. Dagnus is quite a comedic figure in Christopher's hagiography. He falls on his face out of fear when he first gazes upon Christopher's giant body and scary face. Then he passes out for half a day when Christopher doesn't burn. And finally, arrows Dagnus assumed had already killed Christopher turn around to pierce him instead, in the eyes. Christopher is finally dispatched by being beheaded. Before he dies, he prays that his relics be given healing and miraculous powers, to which God agrees. Then Christopher offers Dagnus a gift. Tyrant, I will be dead by tomorrow. Then make a paste with my blood and rub it on your eyes, and you will recover your sight. Dagnus follows these instructions. His sight returns, and he converts. He decrees that from now on, it's non-Christians who will be beheaded. Dagnus might be Christian now, but he hasn't changed. The penalty for worshipping gods he doesn't worship is still death. As I mentioned, this is the most popular version of St. Christopher's legend, and the most recent. The beginning of the story where Reprobus searches for the most powerful ruler to serve, and where he ferries Christ across a river, doesn't appear until the 12th century. The description of Christopher's face is also different from older versions of the story. Many hagiographers provide detail of the giant's wild shaggy hair, generally dark, to suggest someone from the east, someone foreign. In Spanish hagiographies, Christopher often has wild red hair likely indicating he's Jewish or from the Levant, equally foreign and other. Most remarkable, though, is that until the 12th century, the giant Christopher also had the head of a dog. He was a cynocephalus, a dog-headed cannibal. Half-human, half-animal beings are common in the ancient world, and common images in early Christianity. The four evangelists, the historic figures credited with writing the Gospels in the New Testament, 
are each associated with an animal symbol. Matthew by an angel, a man with bird wings. Mark's symbol is a winged lion, Luke, a winged bull, and John, an eagle. The saints are often pictured with their winged animal symbols, and in antiquity, as men with the heads of their symbolic animals. The origin of these animal-headed divinities can be traced to Coptic Christian art in Egypt from the 1st and 2nd centuries. These Christian depictions would have been influenced by the art of other religions prevalent at the time. Ancient Egyptian religions are filled with animal-headed gods. Toth is a god with the head of an ibis. Horus has a falcon's head. Bastet, a cat's head. These gods don't literally have a human body and an animal head. The head determines the original form of the deity. For example, Sebek is a god with a crocodile's head. This means his natural form is that of a crocodile. His human body means he also has a human form. Similarly, the human-headed sphinxes with lion's bodies that guard the pyramids are humans who can transform into lions. One of the most important Egyptian gods is Anubis, a dog-headed man. He's the god of death and embalming, the protector of graves, and companion of dead souls. Scholars point out the similarities between Anubis, the dog-headed Christopher, and other deities that preside over death. The land of the dead in many ancient religions is separated by a body of water, a river. St. Christopher ferried travelers from one side of the river to another, not unlike Charon, the boatman on the river Styx in Greek legends, who ferried souls from the land of the living to the land of the dead by crossing the river Styx. A river crossing symbolizes a change in the state of being, be it from life to death or a change of heart, like conversion. Ancient Christians would have read Christopher's River Crossing as a familiar journey undertaken by many other deities who ferried lost souls to the afterlife. The river itself would have had additional meaning for Christians. It's a place of baptism. The connection between a dog-headed Christopher and a dog-headed Anubis would have been very clear to early Christians. Sinocephaly, dog-headed beings, aren't just confined to deities. Ancient Greek writers like Theseus, Megasthenes, and Herodotus all chronicled alleged foreign races with human bodies and the heads of dogs. Their half-animal, half-human nature was a comment on their otherness. They were degenerates. And it's as a degenerate Sinocephalus that we first meet St. Christopher in the earliest versions of his legend. Here's a description of his appearance from a Decius hagiography. One of Emperor Decius's ministers has witnessed the miracle of Reprobus's staff growing leaves and describes the terrifying giant to the ruler. He said he's so horrible in that it is that of a dog. The hairs of his head are hugely overgrown and reddened like gold. Also, his eyes are like the morning star and his teeth jut out like a wild boar's. It is not possible to explain his size in a speech. As in the Golden Legend, Reprobus is massive and fearsome. Even more so here because he has a dog's head. Plus, the land where his people come from are cannibals, though we're never explicitly told if Reprobus himself has ever eaten human flesh. Reprobus's monstrousness is always emphasized in every version of his legend. One of the oldest English language hagiographies appears in the Noel Codex. This codex is a 16th century compilation of manuscripts that date to the turn of the first millennium. It includes a Decius version of St. Christopher's Passion, a fantastic description of faraway lands with Sinocephaly called Wonders of the East, an English translation of the Book of Judith from the Old Testament, and the only surviving manuscript of the Old English epic poem, Beowulf. When we first meet the dog-headed reprobus in the Noah Codex, he isn't in search of a master to serve. He's living his life in North Africa among his dog-headed cannibalistic people. Troops of Emperor Decius, sometimes Diocletian, capture him in a raid in Serenica in modern-day Libya. He's conscripted into the Roman army, as male prisoners often were, and placed in the unit of the Mamariti, an historically attested regiment comprised of fighters from a Berber tribe in the region called the Mamariti. While serving as a soldier, Reprobus witnesses the persecution of Christians, and it pains him. So he leaves the army and wanders about Roman-controlled North Africa. As in the Dagnus Strand, 
Reprobus doesn't understand Greek, so he can't communicate with any of the locals. When he prays in the Decius stories, a mysterious man in white appears, an angel. He places his mouth on Reprobus's lips and blows. Suddenly, Reprobus can understand as well as speak Greek. As before, Reprobus confronts the authorities, his staff sprouts leaves, witnesses convert. When Decius's soldiers come to arrest him, the angel Raphael appears and miraculously multiplies the soldiers' rations, which were running out. It's this miracle that converts the soldiers in Decius' stories. Reprobus then leads the regiment to Antioch, a distance of about 3,000 kilometers, where a bishop named Babylas baptizes them all. It's at this point that Reprobus becomes Christopher. In these early versions of the hagiography, Christopher's name, the Christ-bearer, isn't literal. He doesn't bear Christ across a river. He bears Christ with him in his heart. After the baptisms, Christopher insists the soldiers bring him to the emperor in bonds. What follows is a list of tortures, similar to the ones he endured in the Dagnus texts. We now meet Nicaea, called Galenica in this version, and Aquilina, who as before failed to seduce him, and they convert. Their change of heart comes about when they see Christopher's face, quote, burning like a flame, and fell on their own faces from the third hour until the sixth hour. It's the horror of Christopher's dog face that compels the women in the Decius strand to think of the horrors they themselves have become, then convert. The women are tortured horribly as per usual, and martyred. The Decius story adds a detail of Christopher thrown into a well and rescued by angels before he's finally beheaded by the emperor. The Decius strands continue after Christopher's death. A bishop named Peter of Atalia ransoms the body and takes it to his home, which has been argued to be Antalya, Turkey, or a corruption of the name Alexandria in Egypt, or even an unusual spelling of Italia, Italy. Most believe Alexandria to be the final resting place of St. Christopher. In the dog-headed hagiographies, a lot of focus is given to the way people react to Christopher's face. In one of the Dagnus texts, a woman is the first to spot Christopher when he enters the city to confront the persecutors. She's terrified by his dog face, but rounds up a group of people to gawk at him like a circus attraction. Here's a line from an old Latin Dagnus text that describes this scene as Christopher sits on the metal chair, surrounded by flames. And the king came and saw Christopher standing, praying in the middle of the fire, and his face was like a new rose. The king, upon seeing this, fell down on his face out of great fear from the first hour until the ninth hour. Christopher's face has temporarily changed. Perhaps it's been transformed by his ordeal in the fire and the protection given him by the Christian God whom he so dutifully serves. However changed and rose-like though, the face is still a horror to behold. It's important to note that the only Christian in the story is a monster. He's the hero, the enlightened one despite the outward appearance and heritage of an outsider, a foreign cynocephalus. This is in direct contrast to all the hagiographies we've explored so far in which the saints are fit, beautiful, and perfect physical specimens in contrast to the ugly men out to get them. St. Christopher is the only ugly saint. Eastern Orthodox art often shows St. Christopher with a dog's head, even in contemporary icons. The Russian Synod outlawed this iconography, deeming it superstition in 1722. But Synods not under the influence of the Church in Russia ignore the decree, and the depictions continued. St. Christopher's dog head wasn't just problematic to Russian Orthodox officials. The Catholic Church in the West found it a theological conundrum. St. Augustine, a hugely influential scholar and early church founder, devoted some thought to Sinocephaly in his treatise, City of God. The question in Augustine's mind is whether or not a half-animal being is a son of Adam, a descendant from the first human, and therefore able to be saved and go to heaven. St. Christopher was an interesting case study. He wasn't just your average Sinocephalus. He died a martyr and was responsible for the conversion of hundreds of pagans. 
But does his dog head mean he's an animal, which the Bible states has no soul and cannot be saved? Augustine doesn't provide a definitive answer, but it was clearly a provocative subject. By the 12th century, Christopher's dog head disappeared in new hagiographies in the West, replaced with a fearsome face, wild hair, and a great big beard to indicate his otherness. And the reprobus prequel in which he searches for a master was added. This normalizing of the story, giving reprobus a narrative purpose, making him a literal bearer of Christ, and removing the head of a dog, resolved the tricky question of, well, dogma. Now fully human, Christopher is unquestionably bound for heaven. Gone was the dog head in Western art. Christopher is still very easy to spot, though. Like Saints Barbara, Margaret, and Catherine of Alexandria, Christopher is one of the 14 holy helpers. In artworks of the 14, he's the bearded one that towers over the others. A giant with a tangle of hair, a child on his shoulder, and a staff in one hand. In German art, where his beard and hair are particularly wild, and his clothing particularly unkempt, he looks like Hagrid, with a baby Harry Potter riding on his shoulders. From the 16th century onwards, Christopher was normalized. He progressively became a jock, muscled, handsome, smart haircut, sculpted beard. Not the saint described in the hagiographies at all. In about 400 years' time, his transformation would be complete, and Christopher's cult would explode in his new guise as the patron saint of surfers. There is a saint who is actually a dog, a French folk saint not officially recognized by the Catholic Church. A 13th century knight who lives in a castle near Lyon returns from a hunting trip one day to find the nursery in total chaos. His infant son is nowhere to be found. Guinefert, the knight's trusty greyhound, approaches. There's blood dripping from his jaws. In a fit of anguish and rage, the knight slays the dog certain that the blood on the hound's jaws is his son's blood. As soon as the deed is done, the knight hears a baby's cry. He discovers his son underneath an upturned cot, and by his side, the dismembered body of a viper. Gwyneford, the faithful hound, had saved the baby. Realizing his mistake, the knight and his family build a shrine to their dog which soon becomes a pilgrimage site where locals leave unwell babies to be miraculously healed through Gwynefert's intercession. This story has many cognates around the world and through time. Like the legend of St. Barbara we explored in episode 4, the legend of St. Gwynefert is an archetype, one of many faithful hound tales from Wales, Germany, and Eastern Europe. The tale's roots can be traced to Asia, particularly India and China, where the doomed dog's role protecting a baby from a snake or wolf is taken up by a faithful mongoose. Despite the church's edicts to stop St. Gwynefert's cult, it persisted well into the 20th century. Like St. Gwynefert's tale, St. Christopher's legend has ancient antecedents. His legend may be a conflation with that of another saint, St. Menos of Egypt. Menos was born in 285, around Christopher's time, and was extremely popular from the 4th to 8th centuries. Menas is the son of Eudoxius, the ruler of an administrative region in Roman Egypt. His mother, Euphemia, is childless and tearfully prays before an icon of the Virgin Mary to conceive a son. She hears the icon sigh the word Amen. When Euphemia's prayers are answered, she names her newborn son Menas, an anagram of Amen. When Menas is 14, his father passes away. A year later, he joins the Roman army with a high rank due to his father's status. Whilst in the army, he witnesses Christian persecutions and decides to leave. Menas spends the next five years wandering the desert as a hermit until he has a vision one day. 
a host of angels crown various martyrs in a glorious ceremony. Menas longs to be a martyr himself. A divine voice addresses him. Blessed are you, Menas, because you have been called to the pious life from your childhood. You shall be granted three immortal crowns, one for your celibacy, another for your asceticism, and a third for your martyrdom. Following the angelic revelations about his future, Menas immediately turns himself in as a Christian to face his death and prophesies martyrdom. There are many parallels between Menas's story and Christopher's. Both desert the Roman army, both are from North Africa, at least in the earliest versions of Christopher's hagiographies, and both saints have their bodies moved to Alexandria upon their deaths. Menas's dead body is perhaps more interesting than his living self. Soon after his death, Christian persecution ceased according to his hagiography. Pope Athanasius of Alexandria has a vision in which an angel instructs him to load a camel with Menas's corpse, then head to the Libyan desert. The Pope sets off. At a certain spot, the camel simply stops and refuses to move. This is the location Menas has chosen for his own burial. Years later, during a Berber uprising, the governor of Alexandria secretly exhumes Menas's body and carries it on campaign to subdue the Berbers. The governor is victorious. Menas's corpse is such a good luck charm that the governor decides to take it home with him to Alexandria, where it could be used as a weapon for future campaigns. When the camel carrying Menas's corpse passes by the spot of his burial, the animal sits down and refuses to move. The governor realizes his folly. He creates a silver coffin, and St. Menas is reinterred in the place he chose to lie. Menas's body was discovered in the 4th century in a town now called Abu Mina, about 45 kilometers southwest of Alexandria, presumably the spot where the camels had sat down. According to academic David Woods, locals identified the remains as belonging to an unknown martyred saint and gave the body an honorific name, Christ Bearer. The name stuck, and Menos became Christopher. David Woods poses a provocative theory that Christopher and Menos are the same historic person with different cults that grew up independently around them. St. Julian the Hospitaller is another saint whose legend has parallels with Christopher's. Before he was even born, Julian is predicted to do great things. But after he kills a mouse in church for making too much noise, his cruelty towards animals grows and culminates in a horrible massacre of all the deer in a valley. A stag curses Julian to kill his own parents. Julian leaves his home to thwart the curse and walks for 50 days when he meets a woman and falls in love. 20 years pass and Julian's parents have been searching for him all this time. One day they meet a woman outside a church whom they discover is their son's wife. Julian's wife invites them to stay at her house. She suggests they use the bedroom and rest while they wait for their long-lost son's return. Julian comes home that evening to find a man and a woman together in his bed. Thinking it's his wife with another man, Julian kills them both in a jealous rage. When Julian discovers what he's done, he runs away to the wilderness to repent for all his sins. He finds himself in an abandoned river crossing and decides to devote his life ferrying people across. One day, a leper asks for help. There's a storm raging, but Julian agrees to take the leper across in his boat. As they cross, the leper asks for food and drink. Julian abides. On the other side of the river, the leper asks for more. First he wants shelter, then a bed to sleep in. Then he asks Julian for the warmth of his body for the night. Julian charitably concedes to every request. In the morning, the leper reveals himself to be Jesus and takes Julian to heaven. There are several versions of Julian's legend, but the detail of Jesus disguised as a human wanting to cross a river is a constant and very similar to Christopher's story. St. Christopher is also linked to an even more ancient legend, that of a Greek hero, an Argonaut named Jason. As a youth, Jason helps an elderly woman cross a raging river by carrying her on his shoulders. She's surprisingly heavy, 
and becomes increasingly so until they reach the far bank and she reveals her true identity. The old woman is a god in disguise, Hera, one of the Olympian gods. The river episode was a test to assess the quality of Jason's soul. His act of kindness earns Hera's protection and also makes him lose a sandal during the crossing, which sets off a series of events that lead to the quest for the Golden Fleece. In the late 1950s, surfers in California started wearing St. Christopher medallions. As the patron saint of travelers and modes of transport, he was adopted by the community as their own saint, who protected them whilst riding the waves. Medallions were exchanged between partners as tokens of love. There's a late 1950s photo of Duke Kahanamoku, the Duke, an Olympic medalist and legendary surfer from Hawaii. He's probably in his 50s in the photo. To his right and left are young 20-something surfers with St. Christopher medals dangling from chains around their necks. Surfers made St. Christopher cool. Elvis Presley amplified the trend by wearing one in 1957's Jailhouse Rock. Steve McQueen sported one at the beach and while riding his motorcycle in the 60s. Ringo Starr famously lost his St. Christopher medal in 1961 when a fan named Angie ran away with the necklace in New York City. A distraught Ringo appealed to fans on local radio later that day, and Angie dutifully returned the necklace, a gift from his aunt, to protect him while traveling around the world on tour. Matt Dillon's character Dally in the 1983 film based on the 1967 novel, The Outsiders, also wears a St. Christopher medal. Dally is the most troubled of the greaser kids, a tragic figure. The medal is a symbol of vulnerability hidden beneath a tough guy facade, and a clue to his restless spirit. The film saw a resurgence of the St. Christopher craze in the 80s that continues today. Chris Evans often wears one, Kim Kardashian purchased a medal from an Australian designer, catapulting the jeweler to success. Shawn Mendes, Blake Lively, Harry Styles, and many others continue to sport the saint around their neck on Instagram and TikTok. St. Christopher and his medal have appeared in countless other books, films, and songs, including Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Truman Capote's Breakfast at Tiffany's, Lloyd Cole's Minor Character, Murder on the Orient Express starring Ingrid Bergman, Joss Whedon's Serenity, Life on Mars, The Green Mile, and many, many more. Head to St. Podcast's website and social media pages to see the many Christopher appearances. The cathedral in Rab, an island of Croatia, displays Christopher's skullcap on the 9th of May, Christopher's feast day for Eastern Orthodox Christians. In the year 1075, a Norman invasion of the island was repelled on this day because of Christopher's intervention. Arrows shot by the invaders miraculously turned and fell harmlessly into the sea, echoing the arrows that turned from Christopher. The 21st of July is another day for Christopher on the island. It commemorates the liberation of Rob from Venice by King Ludovic the Great, with help from St. Christopher. The 27th of July is called Dies Natales, celebrated as Christopher's birthday, the day he died and went to heaven. These events are known together as Rapska Fiera a three-day spectacle that includes costumed historic reenactments, a crossbow pageant, and displays of medieval-inspired arts and trades. The Sunday closest to the 9th of July is called Driver's Day in many parts of Spain. St. Christopher, the patron saint of traveling, protects drivers. In Segovia, a parade of decked-out trucks and buses winds through town to a church where priests bless the vehicles. Prizes are awarded for the best photo, best poem, and best story about truck and bus drivers. Celebrations of Valencia center around an ancient pagan temple rededicated to St. Christopher when an image of the saint was found buried there. An organization founded in 1399 called the St. Christopher's Brotherhood organizes the Christopher Day events. There are parades of trucks like in Segovia and also of classic and vintage cars. Earlier, on the 20th of June, is an indigenous celebration reframed to honor Christopher. It's called Reed Day and refers to plants offered to images of the saint at the St. Christopher Monastery. The offerings are followed by rounds of horchata, a beverage made from chufa, an Egyptian root brought to Spain by the Arabs. It's different from Mexican horchata, which is made from rice. The horchata is accompanied by rosequietas, Valencian breadsticks and a sweetbread called fartons. 
Similar celebrations occur in Mexico with the blessing of drivers and vehicles, though these tend to occur on his Catholic feast day on the 25th of July. Parades feature floats with Christopher statues holding Christ, appearing as indigenous gods surrounded by tropical foliage and fauna. These festivities are repeated all over Latin America. In Guatemala, the dance of conquest merges Christian and pre-Columbian Mayan traditions with masked dances. The ritual alludes to Spanish colonization while invoking encantos, the sacred spirits of the mountain, with offerings of candles, copal incense, chocolate, aromatic herbs, and flowers. Nightfall is welcomed by ceremonial fires and continued dancing. In the morning, the fiera opens. It's a fair in which the dancers, now inhabited by the encantos, carry sacred images of St. Christopher in a procession to the church amidst markets, music, and throngs of revelers. Travel is St. Christopher's domain. His popularity in the digital age is heightened by the possibility of travel for so many of us. The world is a far more accessible place now than 1,500 years ago when Christopher's cult was established. And though we have yet to find conclusive evidence for the existence of Sinocephaly, the wonders of places far away from where we each live are nonetheless spectacular. Christopher's dog-headed story is more relevant than ever. It's this dog-headed man with an unfamiliar appearance, a degenerate, who persuades the so-called normal people to see the world through a different lens. In the legend of St. Christopher, it's a strange-looking foreigner who's the hero. Thank you so much for listening to episode 8 of St. Podcast, St. Christopher, the Dog-Headed Giant. The readings in this episode were provided appropriately by Christopher Rhodes, an English teacher from London. The musical interludes were composed and performed by Stephen Visecki, a musician and educator. Stephen teaches math in California, and you can listen to his music on his SoundCloud account. Head to the St. Podcast website for the link. If you liked what you heard, please leave a rating and a review. It'll help other people find us. And tell a friend. Head to St. Podcast website and social media pages to see images of the people, artworks, events, and objects covered. The email address is feedback at saintpodcast.com. That's saint spelled out, S-A-I-N-T. As always, we would love to hear from you. Episode 9, the penultimate episode in our martyr series, is about another virgin martyr. In fact, episodes 9 and 10 are both about virgin martyrs. Our next saint's legend is perhaps most famously told in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. She's associated with music and has scores of compositions dedicated to her, inspiring musicians from Joseph Haydn to Brian Eno, George Friedrich Handel to David Byrne, Paul Simon, the Foo Fighters, and more. Her story intersects with the development of the tritone, a dissonant chord first popularized in sacred music from the Middle Ages, also known as the Devil's Interval. Tune in next time for the story of St. Cecilia, the patron saint of music.